Today's episode is sponsored by Newspapers.com, the largest online newspaper archive. Newspapers.com makes it easy to find your family's story with more than half a billion digitized newspaper pages from the 1690s to today. Search for obituaries, marriage announcements, birth announcements, photos, and more in papers from across the United States, the UK, Canada, and beyond, stretching back three generations. For listeners of this podcast, newspapers.com is offering 20% off a publisher extra subscription. Just use the code Family Tree Magazine at checkout. That's code Family Tree Magazine for 20% off publisher extra. Welcome to the May 2022 episode of the Family Tree Magazine podcast. I'm Lisa Louise Cook. Our featured interview this month is with author and German genealogy expert James Beidler. We're going to be talking to James about how to research your German-speaking ancestors who lived outside of Germany. Then in the Family History Home segment, we'll cover how to care for some of the most popular heirlooms that you might find around your house, and we'll do that with the family curator, Denise May Levenick. In our Best Websites for Genealogy segment, I'm going to tell you about some of the exciting advancements being made with old maps, and that's being done over at the davidrumsey.com website. And I'm very excited to stop by the editor's desk because I get to introduce you to the latest member of the Family Tree Magazine family. As always, there is a lot to cover, so let's get to it. Uh, first up is Tree Talk with Rachel Christian. As you know, Rachel Christian is the social media editor here at Family Tree Magazine, and she's here to tell us about what's trending in the world of genealogy. Hi, Rachel. Hi, Lisa. So what's on the minds of genealogists this month? Uh, Well, the main thing I want to talk about today is May is National Photo Month. And I know that photos are a uh, significant uh, topic for genealogists, and so Here at Family Tree, we've been doing uh, several photo-related things that I just thought I'd mention. Um, The first of which is we have a newly updated article about how to conduct a photo interview. So we have popular content on our website about uh, family history interviews, but this article focuses on how to interview your family members about either photos that they're in or photos that are in their possession uh, to see what other details you can kind of tease out about your family photos. That has um, a free download that goes with it. So that's the first thing. The other things are we've got two brand new pages on our website, two brand new landing pages about photos. One takes the preservation angle. All our articles on how to minimize damage to your family photos, how to store them correctly, um, that kind of thing. And the other one is research focused. So It brings together all of our articles about how to identify people in photos, how to date photos, um, how to better, you know, read the clues that are in them to see what more genealogical information you can learn. Um, So I will, of course, have links to those, um, all of those things that I mentioned. So yeah, it's, it's an exciting time and photos are always interesting. Well, and, and for those of you listening, when you mentioned them, the landing pages, um, what, what's really neat about this is there's so many different articles and resources on the Family Tree Magazine website, and the landing page kind of pulls it all together. Isn't that right, Rachel? It's like, almost like a table of contents so people can really go to that subject and then dig in where they specifically want to go. Yeah, that's a great way to put it. Uh, our landing pages organize uh, all of our content. Uh, into different topics. So they're a great way to kind of see at a glance um, all the different articles we have and and dive in where you want. Excellent. Well, anything else going on this month we should keep our eyes on? Sure, yeah. Uh, There are two uh, Heritage Month celebrations going on in May. One is um, National Jewish Heritage Month, and the other is National Asian American and Pacific Islander Heritage Month. And of course, um, you know, there are lots of online exhibits and events that are happening for both of those. And um, I'll be sure to include links to those event calendars and things in the show notes as well. Terrific. 
All right. Well, lots to um, to explore this month. And, and I know next we're going to be talking another heritage, German heritage with Jim Beidler. So, uh, hey, thanks so much for helping us kick off this episode. No problem. I hope everyone has fun and, and learns a little bit more about their family photos this month. Even if your relatives spoke German, it doesn't necessarily mean they came from Germany. So it's really important to learn how to research Germans beyond Germany's borders. Here with suggestions on how to do just that is James Beidler. He's the author of the article, Germans from Russia, which appears in an upcoming issue of Family Tree Magazine, as well as uh, there is an online article called How to Research Ethnic Germans in Non-German Regions, uh, which I highly recommend. Welcome back to the show, Jim. Great to be here, Lisa. Well, you are the go-to guy when it comes to uh, doing our German research. And I know that when we do research our German ancestors, we really have to know the time frame that we're talking about because, of course, the borders of Germany are constantly changing over time. Isn't that right? Oh, absolutely. Uh, that's that's a true natural fact, as they say. <laughs> uh, and and the, thing I, the, the thing I have found out over time is – Exactly, you know, the themes of these articles is how many people who were quote unquote Germans never set foot in Germany. Uh, and the, fir- the first thing is uh, the way it comes down to descendants a lot of times is exactly as you said, they spoke German, uh, but it was not their national allegiance. It was just their language. It may, in most cases, was their deep ethnic background. Uh, but what, what we find, instead of them being ever part of a Germany, uh, that they were somewhere in a German enclave in Eastern Europe. Interesting. So what are some of the most common regions and areas that we would find German-speaking people but that was outside of Germany. Well, well, the 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 quick and snarky answer is where weren't they? Because <laughs> <laughs> uh, because and and I you know I got I got to tell you where, when this first was kind of drilled home to me was when I saw a language map of Europe circa 1900. It was a historical map and saw. Eastern Europe dotted with all these small German-speaking enclaves. And that's when I, well, you know, it's not too much to say you kind of understand. I'm not, I'm not giving, I'm not giving them a pass, but you understand why Germany was always trying to conquer Europe because there were Germans all over Europe. That's the, that's the fact. Uh, But uh, they kind of break down into two very, very broad groupings. First of all, what I call the pioneers versus what I call the colonists. The pioneers are the very early ones because some of these enclaves went back deep into the Middle Ages. Uh, and they, they are ones like the, you know, here's a good name for you, the Siebenburger Sachsen, which translates very roughly as the Transylvania Saxons. And it's now in part of Romania. Most of the enclaves are gone, uh, but uh, these these uh, go back into the to the 1300s. Uh, so uh, there there are some like that. The Baltics, the Germans in the Baltics, they also date back dated back to, to medieval times. Uh, but of the colonists are the kind of the later ones. These were people who were invited to areas that were won back from the Ottoman Empire by the Austrians, Hungarians, and the Russians. And they brought in these Germans as colonists for new towns or, in some cases, replacing the locals. Uh, and these are the most, the most popular groups, the most populous groups, I should say. Uh, one is the Donauschwaben 
which translates as Danubian Swabians. Swabia is an area of Germany that many of them were from. The Danube, of course, is the great river that runs through uh, Central and Eastern Europe. And these folks were, were sent east by the Austrian Empire to populate a lot of these areas uh, that they had won back from the, the Ottoman Turks. Then the other very broad grouping of the colonists, and very numerous, are all kind of tagged under Germans from Russia, uh, from meaning when they then emigrated to uh, to North America. Uh, and these uh, these are in the Volga areas, the Black Sea Germans, uh, several different groups that dot through uh, areas that are now under conflict, like Ukraine, into, into Russia, uh, a narrow strip called Bessarabia that's next to Romania. Right. Well, that's one I'm familiar with. I have a bit of, of that in my family tree as well. I imagine them having having these different types of groups where we're looking to very different places for records. Would that be true? Yeah, and it, and it's part and parcel of. First of all, it's it's going to be determined by whatever nation or empire that they were were under at the time, the Russian Empire, the Austrian Empire, uh, some in the, the greater German Second Empire. Uh, and, and then today, of course, it's, it's completely different states, you know, broken up, uh, you know, with, with Poland and Hungary, uh, Romania, all these, all these uh, you know, relatively smaller states that were part of those larger states historically. So knowing, knowing those national borders over, over time is, uh, is an absolute necessity. Uh, and, you know, because yeah, that, that'll determine a lot of times the language of the, uh, the vital records, uh, because even though these, these enclaves invariably kept their, their German tongue or some sort of dialect of it, uh, the, the, uh, the, the, the vital records may well be in the language of the empire uh, to which they, they owed allegiance. So you may find them in Russian, in Hungarian, and so forth. So when somebody is going to be, uh, they've identified that they have ancestors who were German speaking, uh, they're not technically from Germany, um, what do you tell them to do first? Where should they focus their initial efforts? Yeah, well, probably the the best thing th- these these folks from these German enclaves. Uh, now, of course, many of the the enclaves existed all the way up to World War II, and then as the Russian Red Army swept west, those enclaves. You know, if you were German speaking, you got out ahead of the Red Army, uh, and and so th- they then scattered some uh, to uh, to Germany. But many are all the way around the world. Here in America, Australia, uh, there's a true diaspora uh, from the from many of these enclaves, and these folks still have an incredible pride of their their homeland, even though they're in most cases a couple of generations uh, removed from it. And they have a lot of times little fraternal organizations, even even to a particular village, because uh, my 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 touch with with these folks is my uh, daughters were natural children of someone a Donau Schwaben man from the Banat uh, which is now in Romania and this little town in the German tongue named Liebling uh, there is still a Liebling family history association of emigres just from that town and they've they've published a uh, a family history book based on the church records of the town uh, and put together put together a, a photo uh, book of all the original houses uh, from when Liebling was it was a German enclave you know so that's really the the place to start is do a do a Google Google search. I think you know a thing or two about Google searches, <laughs> uh, uh, Lise. Uh, and and uh, you know, see what comes up about the the town as a starting point, because those are people who are going to have loads of of very intimate knowledge still. If they're not original survivors of the enclaves, you know, they'll have the memoirs. They'll have the the uh, the the books, the family history books. 
That's a great suggestion. So many times in genealogy, we feel like we have to just start from scratch and build everything ourselves. But so many people have come before us, haven't they? And they've been capturing the stories, the records, um, the history, and, and might as well stand on their shoulders a bit. Don't reinvent the wheel if you don't have to. Yeah. <laughs> exactly. Well, I know you've got an article coming up in the magazine, Germans from Russia. You men- mentioned them as one of these groups. Tell us a little bit about what we're going to learn in that article. Yeah. Well, we're going to go into the history of each of these specific uh, Germans from from Russia groups. And, uh, you know, there, there are... Uh, Sometimes unique or unique uh, record groups, uh, like like tax records. Uh, well, the equivalent of tax records, because initially a lot of times they were exempt from taxation when they were brought in to uh, to settle these areas. But censuses, you know, there there are they're, they're sporadic, but there there are uh, things like that, and we will detail for each of the groups what are the uh, the the best uh, record groups that will help you. And of course, we also have uh, your other article over at Family Tree Magazine, How to Research Ethnic Germans in Non-German Regions. And that's available to uh, folks who have a premium subscription to FamilyTreeMagazine.com. We'll have links to both of those in the show notes. Always great to talk to you. Thank you so much for giving us some encouragement to finding our German-speaking ancestors. We appreciate it. You bet, Lisa. Always a pleasure to be here. Whether you've inherited a shoebox of old snapshots or an entire house filled with a lifetime of memories, becoming your family's caretaker of the past is a weighty responsibility. And it's also a joy for those of us who understand the the physical connection to our ancestors through these old items. Well, here to give us a few kind of general tips on taming and caring for your entire family heirloom collection is the family curator and author of the book, How to Archive Family Keepsakes, Denise May Levenick. Welcome back to the show, Denise. Hi, Lisa. It's nice to talk with you again. Well, this is a definitely a topic on all of our minds at some point because, you know, hopefully we might inherit a few things or had some things handed down to us. What are some of the most common types of heirlooms that really should be getting our care and attention? Well, there are so many, but we especially get a lot of questions about um, things that people inherit and accumulate in their own life. Bibles, books and magazines, china, crystal and glass. And then there's furniture, jewelry, letters, linens, even military uniforms and musical instruments. And of course, newspaper clippings, photos and photo albums. And you're lucky if you inherited a quilt and some recipe cards. Uh, People ask about silverware, sports memorabilia, timepieces like clocks and watches, and even wedding dresses. Well, wedding dresses on my radar. Uh, <laughs> my daughter just got married, and, and she has a wedding dress that she would love to hand down. And in fact, I have one that I also inherited. Um, let's start there. What can we do to be careful and preserve wedding dresses? Well, wedding dresses are textiles, fabric mostly, although some have uh, beautiful beading that we do have to be extra careful of. You'll want to, first of all, wear white cotton gloves whenever you're working with a textile, especially a white wedding dress. Um, Many dry cleaners are um, very familiar and um, comfortable uh, dry cleaning a recently worn wedding dress. And you definitely should store it clean. So you'll want to take your daughter's dress to the dry cleaners and tell them you're going to be... um, preserving it. They often have um, a bag, a Tyvek kind of a bag. It's um, that sort of new material. It's very lightweight and they can put the the dress in there to protect it from dust and light. Before you even take it to the dry cleaners though, inspect it for damage um, in case you know any food or a wine spilled on anything and you'll want to point that out to the cleaners so they can take care of that and make any repairs. Um, You'll need to tell them if you want to hang it or if you want it to be preserved flat in a box. 
um, if if it's to be hung you can use a special padded hanger that will fill out the sleeves and then they'll stuff the stuff the sleeves with um, acid-free tissue paper and the bodice to keep some shape in there now your dress that you might want to preserve an older dress um, you could do the same thing um, by stuffing the sleeves and the bodice with acid-free tissue and either fold it and put it in an acid-free box really big one or hang it on a padded hanger that's a great idea uh, in fact <laughs> Uh, at the end of the wedding, I noticed that a little button had cover had come off and things like that. So I like that attention to detail that we inspect however old the dress is and um, make notes of things we might want to get repaired and things. Because once it's tucked away, it might be not, not be looked at for some time. Uh, yeah. I'm, I'm thinking also about other types of textiles. I know um, we have my husband's father's military uniform. Many people have inherited military uniforms. Is there anything else that we should be thinking about in terms of that type of textile? Well, a military uniform, of course, um, is also going to be fabric. But, it, you know, we often have, um, sometimes the metals are left on, any kind of insignia. Yeah. Um, patches, I think if they're sewn and they're fabric, you're going to want to leave them on. But if it's um, any kind of uh, pins or even buttons. Some people take the buttons off of uniforms, but if you want to leave them, you might want to um, cover them with acid-free tissue to prevent tarnish um, from the air. Um, you're going to want to protect it from sunlight, moisture, and insects. And I would not suggest taking an older uniform to a dry cleaner unless they are experienced in preserving um, vintage clothing. It's live my grandfather's World War I uniform and um, it's, it's still in pretty good shape. I, you can give it a light vacuuming with the, a hose vacuum. Put an old nylon. Do any of us have old nylons? <laughs> Put it over the nozzle <laughs> of the vacuum and um, gently try to get any dust off of the fabric. Um, I don't know. I think the um, the boxes are better for uniforms because they are so heavy to hang on a hanger. And they also will keep the light out. So, again, acid-free tissue in the legs of pants or uh, jodhpurs in my grandfather's case they were um, short pants mm -hmm. and jacket sleeves and that you know that that's a, you just really have to keep it um, in a place that is temperature controlled you don't want it to be too wet where it will get humid or too hot or cold so please don't put it in your attic big box like that it's good to store it on a a closet shelf, maybe an unused closet where it will be in the dark and protected. Great. Okay, so that whole atmosphere of where the storage happens is is really important. Um, and, you know, you mentioned something very different from material, which would be things like books and magazines. And a lot of us will have something of some type that we've gotten over the years. Uh, well, how should we deal with those? Well, I... I I mentioned that because people have asked me recently, I've had a lot of questions about how to store books. I think it's because we've we've gone through our books and so many of us are reading ebooks now that we don't accumulate as many and what we yeah. keep we really want to preserve. You know, it's books are designed to be stored on a shelf. So that's a really good way to think about preserving them. The problem is that if they're in um, a room full of light or dust, they can just become faded. The spines can become faded. So if you have old, old books, um, particularly like a family Bible or family photo albums, you might want to consider um, purchasing archival book boxes. And the books can still be, they can be placed in the book box and stored upright, again, on a closet shelf where they're in a kind of controlled um, environment. The temperature isn't going to change much in your home. If you have books kind of 
out where you can see them, be very careful when you take them off the shelf um, not to grasp them by the spine so that it would rip, the fabric might rip. Of course, they can be vacuumed. That's a good way to keep them clean. And, oh, please don't put scotch tape on them if they tear. You know? <laughs> right. We've, we've all got a few of those with some torn jackets or covers, and they get um, hastily repaired. But leave the, the, the re- book repair to the professionals. Or get, um, they make book repair tape you can use. Oh, be careful of pests. They really do like books, silverfish particularly. So it's a good reason to keep them clean, to vacuum and clean your space. I love old books, don't you? Oh, totally. And, you know, I love that idea of the vacuum with the the little nylon over it for all of these types of items or anything that has to be really gently cleaned. Because sometimes it is just that fine layer of dust that we're dealing with that we want to remove before we really tuck them away. Exactly. Exactly. Well, these are all terrific ideas. And uh, as you heard Denise mention at the top of this segment, there are so many different kinds of things that uh, you may have. And maybe as she listed them, you start to kind of think about them around your house. Well, we've got a terrific page for you over at FamilyTreeMagazine.com where you can read her article. And it's called Family Heirlooms, How to Care for the Most Common Types. And it is just laid out wonderfully where you can click on each type of item, read through uh, Denise's recommendations and suggestions, and uh, start taking care of those items today. And of course, if you want to stay in touch with Denise or find out more about what she's up to, do visit her over at her website. It's at thefamilycurator.com, thefamilycurator.com. Thanks again, Denise. Always great ideas. Thanks so much. It's nice to talk with you again. And congratulations again on the wedding in your family. New leaf on your family tree. Thank you. (laughs) Exactly. This month in our Best Websites for Genealogy segment, I want to take a few minutes to tell you about a new collaboration between one of our favorite websites for old maps, the David Rumsey Map Collection, and the Machines Reading Maps Project, commonly referred to as the MRM. Machines Reading Maps uh, recently announced a new one-year collaboration with the David Rumsey Map Collection. MRM includes publicly available code. It's called Map Curator, and it's curator with a K. And the project will apply the technology of this Map Curator to uh, about 60,000 geo-referenced old maps over at the Rumsey Collection. Now, Map Curator, what it does is it scans the text that appears on the maps, all the place names, uh, and it makes all of that text searchable. You can kind of think about it like optical character recognition, which is commonly known as OCR. So we're used to uh, documents being OCR'd, where it can take a digital image of, let's say, a page of text, and it turns it into searchable text. Of course, things like OCR are used very commonly in the digitization and uh, indexing of genealogical records. But of course, documents are comprised of horizontal lines of text, typically, right? Going left to right. But of course, in the case of maps, we're really talking about text, which is the place names, and and they could could be written randomly uh, in all different kinds of directions based on the geography of the area that it's covering. So that's a big problem, or it typically has been the past for OCR, but not for this map curator. So Rumsey maps are ideal for a project like this because so much of the work has already been done. Um, David Rumsey's entire collection is about 150,000 maps, and well over 60,000 of them have already been scanned at really high resolution. And they've also been geo-referenced, which means that they've been matched up location by location with the modern day map. You can see lots of examples of these free maps over at davidrumsey.com. So the fact that 
so much of this work is already done. The scanning's been done. The georeferencing has been done. Uh, that means that they can jump straight into having Map Curator read and document the text that's found on the maps. The data that's generated is going to help make the Rumsey Map Collection the first large digitized map collection in the world to be fully searchable by text. And that's pretty exciting. Now, according to their recent press release, the project is being made possible by a generous donation from David Rumsey himself and the MRM teams, including researchers at the Alan Turing Institute, the University of Minnesota, and the Austrian Institute of Technology. These organizations Now, these organizations benefit a lot because they're going to be able to test and expand their tools and methods working with such a uh, large collection. It's kind of like machine learning. The more it works on a collection, the better it gets at doing it, what it's doing. Uh, It really learns through artificial intelligence. And of course, it really benefits the Rumsey Map Collection because it is such a massive collection to start with, and it's going to make it even more useful and valuable, particularly for those of us who use the collection for family history research. For all the place names, they're also going to be inferring the semantic types. In other words, they're going to be creating really context and establishing the relationship between the found words that are appearing on the map. And they'll be adding links to external knowledge bases like Wikidata. This means that many more features that previously didn't appear in the map's metadata will be visible and discoverable. The project also hopes that researchers are going to be able to conduct complex searches across a variety of maps, uh, which really hasn't been possible before. So if you're doing a research project, and there might be many different kinds of maps out there, um, you want to be able to search across all of them and and bring together that unique collection that meet your criteria. So for example, if your ancestor owned a saloon during the California gold rush, let's say, uh, you might want to conduct a search for all maps containing references to saloons in the 19th century in California. Now that level of detail likely would not be included in the map description, it wouldn't be necessarily in the metadata, but there may be text that appears on um, a variety of different maps. And that's what Map Curator can find. It can find each time the word saloon is mentioned on a map, no matter how small the notation, uh, it could find it and pull just that unique grouping together. And when you take a look at the David Rumsey maps, it's amazing how many different maps there are. I mean, you think, well, that's kind of odd. They would actually mention saloons. Well, there is such a variety of maps over there. Some of them are very pictorial. You know, they're very illustrated. Some have just one unique purpose. It might be actually tracking all the saloons in California. You don't know. It's such a massive collection that Uh, Unless you can search for those keywords that may just only appear on the map, you might never run into uh, a map with a particular piece of information that you're looking for. In fact, over at the show notes, uh, I'm going to have a link and uh, hopefully some images for you so you can kind of see how this works. Uh, They give an example in the press release of a zoomed in portion of a map and a very old map from France. And you can see how Map Curator is uh, spotting and circling. (laughs) There's a red outlining around each of the pieces of text that it's finding on the map. And then it's also converting it into typed text, which then, of course, becomes searchable text. It's amazing and um, something that, if this all goes well, could really make a huge difference for map research for years to come. The press release from MRM says that this operation will generate an unprecedented amount of free and reusable data of great historical, geographical, scientific, and anthropological value, as well as precious metadata that will improve the accessibility of the collection and active engagement with map enthusiasts. And at the end of the collaboration, they are going to showcase the data 
and the new functionalities that they've implemented and talk about kind of what the next steps are in a a large public event that's going to be held at the David Rumsey Map Center at Stanford Libraries. So you'll want to put this on your radar and uh, stay tuned to this podcast. I'm sure we'll be talking about it again in the future. And um, also at the show notes at familytreemagazine.com slash podcasts, I will have a link over to the Machine Reading Maps GitHub. It's that free open source code. And uh, if you're on the techie side of things and you want to check that out, we'll have that link available for you. Well, as we stop by the editor's desk this month, I am delighted to be introducing you to a brand new member of the Family Tree Magazine family, Melina Papadopoulos. Welcome to the show, Melina. Hi, Lisa. It's great to talk to you. It's great to meet you. I know that you are the new digital editor over at Family Tree Magazine. So what does that mean? What does a digital editor do at Family Tree Magazine? So basically, as digital editor, my job is to... um, Look at our website, see what kind of content we need to, we either need to update and refresh to make sure it's where it needs to be in terms of relevancy and depth, and also to look and see what we also need to add to um, either increase engagement or um, appeal to our current audience, and also just general maintenance, make sure that um, our current articles follow our current standards for WordPress, make sure that they're the right format, make sure that people can access links that they would like to access, especially for our best website um, page, um, since we have so many great resources on our website for um, people who want to continue their research. So that's another big part of my job. And um, just in general, ensuring that there's content that people can enjoy and um, when they visit our website. Yeah, the website over the years, and I've been involved with Family Tree Magazine for over a dozen years now, and it's it's amazing how it's managed to keep up and evolve. I mean, the genealogy as an industry continues to evolve, and we get so many new websites, so much new technology. Um, a lot of the the standard, you know, practices and methodologies remain the same, but it all, I'm sure, has to be kept all together and really cohesive. So, sounds like a big job. Um, I'm interested, curious what your background in genealogy is. I know not everybody has a lot of experience in it, but boy, working with the magazine is sure an education, isn't it? It definitely is, Lisa. Um, I definitely came into this, into this role, not a super genealogy expert, I will admit, but I've always very much been into learning the history of people and family history and learning about, you know, where I come from, where think, where people come from, where how people come to be who they are. And I think all those things are definitely covered in genealogy and, fam- and things of that nature. And I find that as I jumped into this position and taken on this role and uh, looked at the content that we have on our website and updated it, it's really helped me, um, you know, understand exactly where genealogy fits into everything in terms of history, in terms of, you know, personal matters. And it's definitely been rewarding so far. Oh, yeah, I bet it's you uh, have to review all the content. Wow, that's, that's a just a fire hose of education, yeah, I'm sure with all the so. years of content. Yeah, well, and I detect, let me guess, you have a Greek heritage with Papadopoulos? That's correct. <laughs> Ah, so there might be some uh, some more investigation into that area. Yeah, definitely. So I know that on our website we do have a whole um, guide to Greek surnames, which I de- looked into yes. before I started my um, position here, and that was very, very enlightening. Um, kind of built off what I already know about um, my, you know, my surname and um, my background, and I definitely plan to keep investigating. <laughs> Well, you said that, you know, the web content is a big part of what you do. And um, I've been seeing some changes, some improvements. Uh, we, we've actually been talking with some other folks here in today's podcast about some of the new landing pages. Tell us what some of the website updates are that we could be looking for. Right. So um, one of the big uh, updates I've made recently was to our photos landing pages. If you go to our Explore by Topic section on our website and go under photos, we I have two different landing pages that I've been working on, photo preservation and tracing ancestors. And 
these landing pages kind of allowed me to curate all the content we have on photos and how they relate to um, genealogy into one easy to access, well, two easy to access places since they're two landing pages. The photo preservation page focuses more on projects for preserving photos that you find um, as you are researching your family history, find photos that you really want to keep that might be might have been exposed to the elements, might really need some extra care because they're so delicate. Um, you can find plenty of resources under photo preservation that can help you ensure that you're taking the right steps to preserve those. Um, we have the photo preservation um, article. We have an e- a free ebook that's highlighted on that page, as well as some tips for organizing um, your photo books, understanding different types of photos, and just um, some even some, even some free um, resources you can download easily from that page. And then the tracing your um, ancestors' photos kind of ha- delves more deeply into actually understanding where those photos come from. You know, who's in the photos? What? Why are they wearing what they're wearing? You know, how can we add, contextualize what's going on in this photo and who this ancestor is? And on that page, I curated more content about um, what steps to take for um, finding ancestors in your photo. How can you identify them? How can you track down information that you're looking for um, and, where, and what websites or resources can you use to find those um, ancestors. So we definitely had a lot of different photo content when I came into this and I, my, you know, my goal was definitely to make sure that the, all that content was easy to um, access in one place so that, you know, when you, if you're really looking to sit down and um, make sense of all those photos and really preserve them and enjoy them for um, what they are. You have a resource to, you have some resources to go to and access them and um, preserve them in a way that's meaningful to you. Absolutely. Well, there's, you know, so much in every issue of the magazine and yet so much more on the website and you're making it easier than ever to access. So we're excited about that. And of course, everybody can find all the content that Melina's talking about over at familytreemagazine.com. Well, it is great to meet you. I am so looking forward to talking to you in future episodes. Thanks so much for joining us. No worries, Lisa. It's been great talking with you as well. Thanks for joining me for this May 2022 episode of the Family Tree Magazine podcast. It's the show from America's number one genealogy magazine. You will uh, find links and information about everything we talked about today over at the show notes page. You'll find that at familytreemagazine.com slash podcast. And there you can also sign up for our newsletter. It's absolutely free and full of great tips. If you're listening to us in a podcast app, we'd really appreciate it if you would give us a five-star review. That'd be wonderful. And while you're in your podcasting app, come check out my show, The Genealogy Gems Podcast. Until next time, have fun climbing your family tree. Today's episode is sponsored by Newspapers.com, the largest online newspaper archive. Newspapers.com makes it easy to find your family's story with more than half a billion digitized newspaper pages from the 1690s to today. Search for obituaries, marriage announcements, birth announcements, photos, and more in papers from across the United States, the UK, Canada, and beyond, stretching back three generations. For listeners of this podcast, newspapers.com is offering 20% off a publisher extra subscription. Just use the code Family Tree Magazine at checkout. That's code Family Tree Magazine for 20% off publisher extra.